The Vita 120 from Silverstone is a slim ARGB AIO that has a price tag of around 110 USD. But is it any good? Let's find out. What's up everyone, Eric here and welcome to Hardware for Gamers. For those of you who are new to the channel, I review and test PC cases, CPU coolers, PC case fans, and video cards. Before I get into the overview, just to have full disclosure, Silverstone did send me over this cooler to test and review, but as always, all the opinions expressed in this video are mine, so if you end up liking this video, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel, because it really does help a lot. Okay, I'll be starting the overview with a quick rundown of the Vita lineup. There are two AIOs in this lineup, the Vita 120 and the Vita 240. So nice and simple. Now let's see what comes in the box of the Vita 120. There is the AIO and fan, of course. There is a manual. There is a manual for the ARGB controller, the mounting hardware. There is also a bag that has all the ARGB cables and connectors in it. There is a two-in-one fan cable and a small tube of thermal compound. Taking a closer look at the AIO, the radiator is aluminum with an FPI of 21. The tubing is rubber with a nylon cover and is a pretty typical length at 400 millimeters. Now this AIO is a fair bit different than other AIOs and that's because the pump is actually in the radiator. Now this pump is a 12 volt pump with a max rated RPM of 4200 and it is powered by its own three pin fan header. Looking at the block now, the top of the block has a plastic cap with 5 volt ARGB LEDs. The LEDs are connected by a 4x1 pin connector. Now the cold plate of the block is copper and the dimensions of the block are 74 millimeters wide by 74 millimeters deep by 41 millimeters high. Taking a look at the fan now, this fan has ARGB LEDs. Again, these LEDs are connected by the same 4x1 pin connector as the block. It also has a 4 pin PWM connector with a nine blade design. There are rubber pads on each of the corners. This fan has a max rated RPM of 1800 and a minimum rated RPM of 300. The dimensions of this radiator with the fan attached is 154 millimeters long by 120 millimeters wide by 38 millimeters deep. Now for socket compatibility, the Vita 120 is compatible with most Intel mainstream sockets as well as Intel's HPC lineup. For AMD compatibility, it's compatible with AM4 and AM5, but not Threadripper. Okay, moving on to how to install this CPU cooler. I'll be installing this onto an AM4 motherboard. The installation between Intel and AMD mainstream sockets are pretty similar, but if you are planning on installing this onto an Intel socket, please check the installation guide. Now, as always, before you start, make sure you have a clean, flat, and sturdy surface. You should also have some kind of mat, preferably an anti-static mat. You will also need a PH2 screwdriver, and you will also likely need some isopropyl alcohol. Now, to install this onto an AM4 or AM5 motherboard, you will need the backplate that came with your motherboard. I'll start by installing the fan and radiator onto my test system. Now, because of where the pump is, it doesn't really matter how and where you place the radiator and tubes. Within reason anyways, meaning you can't install it backwards or something, at least in a normal case. Now, to install the block, you should have your motherboard already mounted inside your case. Now, you will need to first find the AMD plastic spacers and standoffs. Then, you'll need to align the AMD backplate to the holes on your motherboard from underneath. Now you will likely need to hold the backplate to the motherboard until you have the mounting standoffs installed. Now we will need to find the AMD mounting clip. Simply slide the AMD mounting clip onto the block. With the AMD mounting clip on the block, it's time to clean off the CPU with some isopropyl alcohol. Then apply the provided or your own thermal compound to the CPU's IHS. So with the correct mounting clip installed onto the block, Plus making sure you have removed the sticker from the bottom of the cold plate. Place the block cold plate down onto the CPU's IHS. Making sure to align the holes on the mounting clip to the standoffs. Then screw in the four spring retention screws. 
you will need to use your PH2 screwdriver to make sure that all the spring retention screws are tight. Once that's all done, we'll need to plug in all of the cables, starting with the pump. This connector should be plugged into the pump header on your motherboard, if your motherboard has one. If your motherboard doesn't have a pump header, you should be able to use a typical fan header with no issue. Next, I'll plug in the fan into the CPU fan header on the motherboard. With that done, I'm going to daisy chain the 5 volt ARGB cables of the fan to the block. So plug in the male lead from the fan into the female connector on the block. Then plug in the male lead from the block into the female connector on the motherboard sync cable. Then plug the corresponding 5 volt ARGB connector onto your motherboard. And with that, we're finally done. Okay, I'll quickly go over the RPM of the fan and pump as well as take a look at the ARGB LEDs. Starting with the RPM of the fan while attached to the radiator. So with the fan at 100% PWM, this motherboard is showing the RPM of this fan bouncing around between 1920 and 1835, which is a bit odd. Dropping the PWM to zero, the motherboard is now showing the RPM to be at around 345-ish. Now for the pump, at 12 volts, the motherboard is showing the pump at 4100-ish. Now on this motherboard, the pump was shutting off if the voltage dropped below 3.9 volts, but at 3.9 volts, the motherboard was showing the RPM to be 2020-ish. Okay, so that's it for the RPM ranges. Now taking a look at the ARGB LEDs. The fan and block both look good. The LEDs are bright and the colors are quite vibrant in both low light and in a bright room. Not really sure what else to say. What do you guys think? Do you agree? Now, before getting onto the temperature testing, if you appreciate or end up appreciating all the testing that I've done here, then please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. 100% of what I receive goes towards buying things to review. I will have a link down in the description. Plus, if you haven't watched my CPU cooler testing methodology video, I strongly suggest you do. It's where I go over the how and what of my CPU cooler testing. I'll have a card above and I'll also have it linked in the description. In the 67 watt full speed test, the Vita 120 had an average steady state CPU temperature of 61.6C. That lands the Vita 120 in the middle of the chart with a DBA of 37.7. Then in the 35 dBA noise equalized 67 watt test, the Vita 120 had an average steady state CPU temperature of 62.2 C, which again lands the Vita 120 pretty much in the middle of the chart. In the 87 watt full speed test, the Vita 120 had an average steady state CPU temperature of 76.6 C, and that has it near the bottom of the chart. Then in the 35 dBA noise equalized 87 watt test, the Vita 120 had an average steady state CPU temperature of 77.8 C. And again, that lands it near the bottom on this chart. Now in the 150 watt full speed test, the Vita 120 had an average steady state CPU temperature of 84.4 C. Then in the 35 dBA noise equalized 150 watt test, the Vita 120 had an average steady state CPU temperature of just under 87 C. So a 2.5 Celsius difference between the 35 dBA and full speed tests. Okay, so what do I think of the Vita 120 from Silverstone? Now this is a bit of an odd one because it didn't perform as well as some of the much cheaper tower coolers that I've tested, but that's because this AIO isn't meant for a standard ATX case. It's meant for a small form factor case. At 38 millimeters thick, this fan radiator combo can fit pretty much any case that can hold a 120 millimeter fan. So when you compare this cooler to a cooler that can actually fit in a small form factor case, like the AMD Spire or the AXP90s from Thermalright, it performs pretty well comparatively. Now there is obviously a pretty large price gap there still, but the Spire and the X53 couldn't actually cool 150 watt load, but the Vita 120 can ish. I wouldn't really recommend the Vita 120 if you're going to be pushing 150 watts or higher consistently. 85C is getting up there. Around 100 to 120 watts would be my recommended max for this AIO. 
So a Ryzen 8 core or Intel is equivalent if you're looking to do CPU renders. If you are looking to just game, you would likely be fine with anything up to a Ryzen 12 core or Intel's equivalent. So yes, this is a very niche cooler that most people probably shouldn't ever really look at unless you're wanting to build in something really small like the Sugo 16 from Silverstone or the A1 from Inwin and want something that can cool a CPU quite well. Because the price to performance just doesn't make sense for a standard ATX or micro ATX case where you can actually fit a standard tower cooler. Well, that's all I've got for this one. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're still watching and you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you get notified whenever I drop a new video. There is also the HFG Discord server. It is completely free to join. All you have to do is agree to the server rules and then you get to see all of my charts. There will be a link in the description. You can also support me directly on Patreon. Again, a link is in the description. You may also want to check out my CPU Cooler playlist. I'll have it right here. And as always, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.